but we're live. There you go. I have no idea why that took a few, literally felt like hours, but that took a few seconds for us to, to go live. I'm not sure if I'm having some connection problems this afternoon, but once we get the connection problems dealt with, I will be live with Steve Mark. I know you can't see me at the moment, so let's bring me on screen. Um, that tells me we're live right now. If you're watching, and if you can see me, and if you can hear me, pop a comment below to let us know that, that you can. Um, as soon as I know that we're live and that I've actually got people here, I'm gonna bring Steve Mark live on screen with me. Just gonna do a couple of things down here before we get going to make everything work properly. So let's just do that. Um, I'm just gonna tag Steve Mark in the post. So if I'm looking down, I'm not ignoring you folk, I promise. I'm just making everything work because I do my own tech. Um, someone's here, someone's watching. Someone's just sent me a um, thumbs up and a celebrate emoji. And, and if that was you, would you do me a favour and pop a comment below so that I, I know that it's you? Who've we got? It says Jennifer Ellis is watching. Let's just tag Steve Mark in this. There we go. That's done that. Um, Jennifer Ellis says, we can see you. Um, thanks, Jen. And um, Tamara is here as well. Thank you, Tamara, for joining us. I'm going to introduce us to Steve Mark. Afternoon, Steve. It, it's, I mean, we've, we've spent the morning together, um, so it's good to see you again. Um, for the benefit of the people who are with us who might not know you, tell them a little bit about what it is that you do. Well, firstly, you, you can never have uh, enough Steph in your life. So, um, But uh, my name is uh, Steve Mark. I'm a digital marketing agency owner, performance marketing agency. Um, and we mainly help uh, trades businesses um, grow their uh, grow and scale their businesses through uh, local performance marketing. But we also work with with quite a broad church of, of other clients and agency owners as well to help their clients grow. And with the trades businesses, I, I, I know because you and I have talked about this quite a lot this morning, they have very specific challenges but the uh, the rest of the small business world need to understand how to market themselves as well, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's really really important, especially if you want to scale a business. Um, you know, it's not it's not too difficult to start a business and um, start to grow it organically. You know, through your inner circle. You know, they always say you know your first customers are going to be the ones that that you know when you first start a business. But beyond that, if you do want to uh, scale or, or grow a business to any extent, then absolutely, you know, marketing will come into your world at some point. And I think, you know, understanding some some basics to do with marketing is is a skill I think that every you know business owner should have in addition to the skills that they have in their particular field. Um, so, you know, and and that goes alongside you know learning skills like accounting and finance. You know, none of us particularly want to do that stuff. We generally outsource it. But I always think. It's good to understand at least some of the basics and you know some of the fundamentals and marketing really is no different i'm always aware that as soon as i as soon as i press the button on this i go into full-on alan partridge mode so I'm, I'm trying to level that down a little bit but if if you've just joined us or if you've been here since the beginning i'm talking to steve mark we're going to talk about marketing and growing your business in a recession if you've got any questions about any of that Pop your questions down in the comments below. Um, we'll bring your questions up on screen and um, Steve and I will be able to answer them for you. We're, we're going to be here for half an hour or so. So if you've if you've got some questions, do pop them below. But before before someone even starts to market, Steve, what what's the first thing that, 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 that people should do as they're preparing for, for marketing their business? So I think one of the one of the fundamental um, sort of uh, um, things that they need to establish um, is to really understand the numbers in their business. Um, and I think that is often something that is uh, neglected or we sort of shy away from because we want to get into the doing before we have to, you know, do some of the, again, some of the um, stereotypically more mundane stuff. And I think, you know, especially with marketing, it's very easy just to dive in 
um, and do a bunch of stuff and not really know whether it's worked. And before long, if you keep repeating that cycle, you're just investing in in wasted marketing. You're you know you're you're wasting your money. So I think knowing your numbers, I would say, is um, especially as we're coming into a time where you know a lot of businesses are facing you know very strong headwinds. Um, pockets are squeezed, um, and I'm talking about the pockets of businesses. You know you've got to really know that where you're putting your marketing budget is working for you. So I think you know for business owners, just understanding three or four really basic numbers will will massively help them. Uh, deal with the challenges um, that are ahead. And and even beyond that, you know, again, to grow and scale a business. So I would say understanding things like how much does it cost you to get a new lead into your business? So, you know, how much are you spending on your marketing to generate a phone call or a website inquiry? Um, how much does it cost to acquire a new customer in your business? So, you know, the, the sort of rough um, sort of calculation there is how many leads do you need to get to get a sale? Um, you know, and then what's the lifetime value um, and what's the average order value of those customers? Because I think, you know, once you understand those those four fundamental numbers, you can then do some sensible planning around your marketing. If you're selling a product that makes you 200 quid, but it's costing you 500 quid to acquire a new customer, very clearly you're going to run out of cash uh, before long, unless you're, you know, very well funded. So I think just by understanding some of those numbers, um, lifetime value of a customer is an interesting one because their initial order value might only be a couple of hundred quid. But if the average time that a customer is going to spend with you is 12 months, then that customer is going to actually earn you two and a half thousand pounds, um, which actually, you know, when you do the math and it's costing you 500 quid to acquire that customer, actually, that doesn't sound like such a bad deal. But you need to understand those numbers, how much it costs you to get, get a new lead, how much it costs you to acquire uh, a customer, um, what's the average order value in your business, across your business, just an average, not looking for precise science here, and then what's the lifetime average lifetime value of a customer. And I think once you start to understand those numbers, then the business of marketing becomes easier. Yeah, it always surprises me that people don't pay more attention to the the lifetime value, um, the the little extra bits that it's worth doing to build repeat customers, to 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 build regular customers. Jen's asked a question, which I'm going to pull up actually on screen straight away. If if there's one thing that small businesses should be doing to promote themselves, Steve, what would what would you advise? So this is a really interesting one, and this um, there's a really great book. And I'm I, I I tend to rely on science rather than you know a gut feeling in marketing um, is is obviously good uh, to to a point, but I prefer to sort of deal with more science and and data. And there's a really great book that uh, was written a few years ago by a chap called Byron Sharp, um, and it's called How Brands Grow, and he has a lot of evidence based sort of approaches um, in that book. And, and there's two things that he talks about. One is um, don't just focus on uh, customer loyalty. Um, so don't just focus on, you know, retaining your existing customers. Um, and that's a, um, a, a challenge businesses have. And it's a bit of a mistake I think businesses sometimes make is they spend too much time uh, focusing all of their efforts on retaining customers when actually they should be out there promoting themselves and marketing themselves to acquire new customers. Um, and then the second thing he talks about a lot in the book, these are just two big takeaways. And the second thing is, um, you know, to be physically and mentally uh, available. Uh, and to do that, you need to create really distinctive brand assets. So I think for, for businesses in this age to sort of not just survive, but, but thrive, it is about creating consistent, strong, distinctive brand assets. Um, and the one thing that you have in your favor is the fact that in my mind, B2B marketing is generally quite stuffy and staid and boring and safe, whereas consumer marketing tends to be far more edgy. So if you're selling to, to businesses, I think you have an opportunity to be really distinctive, to stand out. So to sort of answer the question, you know, there, there is any number of ways, obviously, of promoting your business. But I think coming back to those fundamentals and remembering those rules, uh, make sure that you're out there trying to acquire new customers and not just um, looking after your existing customers, you got to look after them because you got to retain them. But don't you know? Don't invest all your time in that. 
make sure that you're uh, both physically um, and mentally available. And to do that, you need to create really distinctive brand assets um, that stand out from the crowd. Um, and th those could be things like, you know, they, it could be a podcast. We were talking earlier about writing a book. Um, obviously, you know, you're, you're helping me with that. Um, it could be creating a video series. It could be just standing for something and, and using that as, as a way of standing out from the crowd. There's some great marketers on LinkedIn that create really uh, what I would call disruptive content, but they get eyeballs on their content because they're polarizing in their views. They go against the status quo. Um, so so that, that would be my advice is, is to obviously you want to be where your customers are. That, that just goes without saying. But focus on those things of, of not just loyalty, but new customer acquisition and making sure that your your product, your brand is stand out. So focus on building the brand. I just um, if, if I'm looking down, it's because I'm doing stuff for the benefit of the people who are watching. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I did, I just brought the the, the, the book that you were talking about up on screen. Um, yeah. If you are watching us this afternoon, just so that you know, I've spent the morning with Steve um, actually planning his his next book. Um, so if you're not already following Steve Mark on LinkedIn, um, please do so. That was us just a few hours ago this morning um, in Oxfordshire making top secret plans. Well, not so top secret because we've talked about them now um, for Steve's book. If you're not connected with Steve on LinkedIn, um, that's where you'll find him. And I strongly suggest that um, you do go and connect with him and look out for the book. It's going to be aimed, aimed at a particular niche, but it's going to be helpful. The tips in it are going to be helpful for all businesses with, with their marketing as well. Um, Jen, I hope that answered your question. Um, do ask another question if, um, if you've got one or if anyone else has has got any questions as well. Um, there is, um, sorry, I'll just add on. to that. There is a, there is a, a follow on book to how brands grow and it's, um, it has a blue cover and forgive me if I, if I get it wrong, but it, it's um, um, creating um, distinctive brand assets. Um, it's by the same publishing company, Oxford. It has a blue cover um, and I believe um, it's, uh, it's part of the sort of Byron Sharp family of books. So creating distinctive brand assets. Um, uh, so yeah, go and check those out. I can't find that one straight away. Um, so I won't spend the, the, the whole right. of the whole of the afternoon um, looking down at the screen because that looks rude. Um, Tamara has asked that she's a children's author um, and it seems that there are too many options for marketing. I, I, I think every business would, would agree with you, Tamara. It's sort of where do you start? What are, what are a couple of the best options? What's more important, um, growing your brand or followers or marketing, Steve? That's what Tamara's asking. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the, the kind of easy answer to that and I won't take the easy route. I will give you an opinion, but the easy route is sort of is kind of all of that. Um, but of course, how do you you know how do you focus? How do you know you know what you're doing is is working? Um, you know, growing an audience um, is one of the most important things I think for any business. Um, investing some of your marketing spend in uh, brand um, advertising and brand marketing uh, is really important to grow. You know the who you are as a brand, what you stand for, you know, what values you have. Um, and then, of course, you know, we need to get cash in the till. So investing money in um, more sort of direct response marketing um, is also really important. But I think, you know, what I tend to sort of try and do with clients is, especially when you're starting a new business, it's often very difficult to instinctively know, you know, what to do to market your business, what's going to work. And, you know, you kind of have to take the pressure off yourself a little bit and not try and have all the answers. So I always tend to sort of advise of, you know, just test and learning, test some stuff. You know, we, as, as business owners, we should be testing different channels to see what's working, what's not. Um, and don't be afraid to try things, you know, and, and for them, you know, maybe not to work. But I think the important sort of thing when if you're doing lots of testing is to give uh, marketing time to work. That's often the biggest uh, reason why marketing fails and people give up. 
is because they don't give it enough time for it to work. And, and you know, time, it's, it's, uh, there is no definition. Um, I, I would generally say as a rule for most marketing activities, you've got to give it at least three months to give it a proper test. You know, it kind of needs a month to, to start. You know, month two, it starts to give you some data. And month three, you, you can start to look at the results. Um, you can, you know, very quickly get new marketing out there into the world, testing ideas. Um, it's very easy these days with platforms like Wix and WordPress to build some landing pages, build a small website. Don't invest, you know, thousands in your first website. Build something simple. And if people are landing on it and, and seem interested, then that is probably giving you an indication that um, uh, you've got something and then sort of, you know, put put some more time and effort in. But in terms of, of answering that question, where would I put where would I put put my money? Um, it, would, it would be a mix of, you know, as business owners, we have to get money in the till. Um, but also you can't neglect the long term value of building a brand. And the ones that built a brand sort of five, 10 years ago, after the last kind of big recession of, of the late noughties, uh, you know, are reaping the benefits now because they're riding the wave of having built that brand. So, you know, they, they say that the best time to, to work on a recession is, is, is actually before a recession. So get going and, and start building that audience, start building that reputation and start building that brand. Um, Tamara, keep watching or listening because I know Steve's got a load more to say in, in the next 20 minutes or so. So I really hope the answer was helpful. Um, I've got a question from Damien as well. Damien, I'm going to come to you in a second, and I'm so sorry I had to dip out of um, of, of seeing you today. Um, and I know we're booked in for next week, but thanks for, for watching us this afternoon, Damien. I'll deal with your question in a second. Steve, because we're talking about marketing in a recession, is it, if, if, if we head into a recession with the, um, with the cost of living crisis that, that's being talked about so much, is it sensible for people to simply discount at the moment um would an answer be for, for for everyone to to reduce their prices to get more business yeah it's, it's always tempting to sort of go down that route short-term discounting um doesn't work in the long term uh oh thanks tomorrow um short-term discounting uh, doesn't work in the long term you may well generate some sales um, you know, which is a positive thing. And of course, if your business is struggling with cash flow, you may be tempted to go down that route. But what it does, as soon as you start discounting, it devalues your product or service, you know, that you've spent, um, you know, so much time, uh, energy and effort uh, building up. And it suddenly uh, pitches you into a different uh, part of the market. So if you're kind of mid-level and you start discounting, it lowers the perceived value of your product. So my my advice to sort of counter that is um, rather than discounting is to actually look at how you can add value to what you sell. Um, so rather than discounting your product, let's say you're a web designer and you sell a website, a package for £2,000, it might be tempting to go out to the market and say, you know, we'll give you £500 off. Um, as, a, as a short term promotion, I, I do see web designers doing that. Um, but rather than that, see, see how much value you can build into that two thousand pounds. You know, could you, for instance, um, you know, give them six months, you know, free web hosting uh, or 12 months? You know, that's, that's going to cost you pennies, but he's going to build a real valuable deal. Could you cut a deal with a local photographer um, and, you know, and offer, you know, some uh, photography for your website? So rather than discounting your, your product and lowering the perceived value, you're just adding value, but just doing it in a different way. So it's not discounting, it's adding value. It, it's, yeah, I know you, I already knew you had strong feelings about that as well. <laughs> um, it's, I did, well, 20 years of my career as an estate agent in a town where there were lots of other estate agents. And instead of constantly discounting fees, because that's just a race to the bottom, I always felt that the better option was to see what else we could do to maintain our fees so that we maintained a profitable a profitable business that was able to carry on serving customers into the future. Um, and it, it turned out to be the right thing to do. I am going to, we're getting a, a ton of questions, Steve, which I, I know you don't mind. Um, Damien at LiveLink um, says, 
what have you found to, has been the most effective way to measure the success of brand awareness efforts? Do you monitor specific metrics and the type of persona that you target? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's really tough for smaller businesses to measure uh, brand uh, performance on, on any great, great level. Um, you know, of course, if, if you're investing hundreds of thousands, millions uh, in brand marketing, you would have what's called a brand tracker, which is a, a it's kind of like an independent survey. And it asks questions like uh, prompted awareness of brands in the market. So which of these brands do you recognize or unprompted brands uh, in the market? You know, which ones can you recall? Um, so what you'll typically find is if, if a, you know, a company spends big on uh, brand marketing, TV advertising, sponsorships, um, you know, we did a lot of that in my last role, you would then alongside that have a brand tracker pre sort of big spend on, on brand and then post spend on brand. So you get a read of, of brand awareness, you know, before you start spending money and then uh, with your brand tracker in place. You would then, you know, get a second survey done after the big advertising campaign, and then that will give you an indication of the performance of your brand marketing. Um, I suspect we probably don't have a lot of people on the call. We might have, but um, that, are, that are spending millions uh, on their advertising. So, how do you do it as a um, as, as a small business? I think really, uh, if you follow some sound principles about brand marketing and you do them consistently, uh, f you know, for for the the long term. You know, you will start to see benefits in terms of um, how much you have to spend on marketing to acquire customers. If you've got a very strong brand presence, whether that's a personal brand or a business brand, you will start to see the maybe the reliance on performance marketing starting to drop because people already know you, they see you, they, they hear you. So I think as a small business, it's having a voice, it's standing for something, and it's coming back to that um uh, necessity of having really standout um brand assets you know that are really strong really define where you sit in the market um so really tough to measure as a as a small business uh, much easier if you've got eight to ten thousand to spend on a um, brand tracking agency um, but only worth it if you know you you've got sort of national or big regional presence one of the i mean my very unscientific method is that if I'm being booked for for speaking gigs, then then things must be working. But I know that's really unscientific, and I I'm being booked for speaking at the moment, so I know that the marketing I'm doing in that direction is working. Now I need to to look at tipping the balance. Um, I'm going to come to Jen's question in in a minute, and and I'm going to expand on Damien's question then. So from from that point of view. Something's working because people that I've never spoken to before are asking me if I can speak for them. How would I measure the, how would I apply some science to that so that I could tip the balance a little bit future, a, a little bit further so I get even more of that, Steve? What what sort of hints and tips? So, so for me, speaking for Tamara with book sales, um, I'm trying to think of, of who else we've got here um jen with with the customer experience consultancy how could we all tip the balance a, a little bit to, to to make more of our marketing efforts yeah i think it's um it's something that we should all be doing um and it's um it's a little bit of a builder's house with me because um i i tell my clients what to do and i, I don't always do it myself so um you know that's uh, that's on me but um i i genuinely think one of the easiest things you can do is to go back to your your clients that are happy with your work and you know get them to to leave positive reviews of your uh, delivery of your service um, it costs nothing to do that um, but a little bit of time but the the the, the value that that will bring you in the future um, especially on a on a sort of a mass scale um, again it's it's part of building uh, your brand your reputation is part of your brand and how people see that publicly so if you can share, yeah, I've got a few on there. <laughs> if you yeah, can, share, you have, you really oh, I think have. One or two, I think one or two of this year, so I'm not doing too bad. Um, but um, yeah, if you, if you, if you know, if you come back to, um, you know, asking for testimonials, asking for reviews, but I think what really trumps them all is if you can get um, a little video interview with them, the, the power of a of, of video testimonial on your website is just exponential. 
um, and not too difficult to do because, um, and I do this for, for clients, we, we will conduct uh, Zoom interviews where we'll just ask them a bunch of questions about, um, you know, what was the problem you had before you started dealing with um, insert client name here? Um, you know, what were some of the struggles? What were some of the pains you were experiencing? Um, how has it been? What was the onboarding process like? How has it been working with, you know, insert client name here? Um, and what's been, you know, the biggest outcome, you know, that you can share with us? Um, and outcomes are really, really important in marketing. Um, articulating the outcome of what you do is probably the most important thing um, in your marketing, being really, really clear um, on the outcome of what you do. And if you can get people talking about that on video, really, really powerful. You know, when you're talking a five to 10 minute interview with a client, cut it down into, into some little videos. And from that one, uh, one piece of, of um, marketing, you know, you could end up with, say eight to 10 small videos that you can put out on your social media, put them on your website. That's really going to tell a story of what it's like to work with you. I think that's something that even I get a bit squeamish about. Um, certainly when I've run the networking retreat in the past, the, the best advice that I was given, given ages ago, was to do the video testimonials on the first day. Um, not to do the video testimonials when people were, were getting ready to go home. Um, so yeah, we used to do the, the video testimonials for that halfway through the first day, actually have a camera set up so that people could could just do it without much effort themselves. And that did, I've still got a, a, a reel of video testimonials somewhere that did make a, a huge difference to how many other people bought the next session as well. Um, let's see what notes I've got here. Jen has asked that as, um, as a, a couple of technical issues this afternoon. I know the quality of my stream isn't brilliant, although Steve's looking great. And it's bunching up our comments, which I don't know, but I'll, I'll reach out to the wonderful folks at Switcher. But Jen says, as marketers, we understand the need to wait three months to see if a campaign has worked, but from experience, clients might be less comfortable with that. How do we get their support and buy-in for testing, Steve? Yeah, that's, a, that's another corker of a question uh, from Jen. And you know what? It's not easy. It really isn't easy um, because everybody in this Amazon generation wants results fast and they think um you know marketing is is easy um you know switch it on and it should and it should work but there's so many uh, unknowns and to coin a phrase unknown unknowns <laughs> and um and that's the challenge that you've got is every campaign is unique if you've never run a marketing campaign campaign before there are no uh, benchmark numbers for performance so you are just relying on um, on, on, you know, gathering the data initially, but, you know, this is one of the hardest parts of, of this job. And it's something that I'm constantly working on myself is, you know, managing expectations from the outset. Um, and, and I think there's something in this that, that if, you know, if clients are really, really insistent that they get fast results, um, it's probably worth walking away from the deal because it will cost you far more in terms of time. Yeah, the magic wand. It will cost you far more in terms of your time, energy, effort, mental health, chasing results in a, in a very short time span than it would be to walk away from that one and find one that is willing to work with you. I mean, look, I'll be honest, you know, the results that I get for clients, you know, we get some great results, but some of them don't, you know, haven't happened for six to 12 months. You know, it's month. 10 11 and 12 where the real sort of dialed in kind of results that we get are, are starting to happen and, and if the client had walked away at say month six or seven because they weren't happy well then they will have missed you know the the candy the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow just by being a little bit more patient so tough one and I, there's no easy answer but i do think it's genuinely managing the expectations up front and being prepared to walk away if if the um you know, if, if the stipulations around results are, are too too stringent. I'm just going to bring um, Tamara's question up on screen because I, I've, I've got a view on this myself as well. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Can I just, can I just add to that? Carry on. Um, you know, and, and the other thing it does is it puts you as a marketer into, into panic mode. 
And you know the old thing, you never make your best decisions when you're under stress or panicked. And if you're in panic mode, you're less likely to make reasoned decisions. So I just wanted to get that. <laughs> no, it's a really, really good point. Um, it's an incredibly good point. It's sort of, it does segue into what Tamara's asked, because Tamara's asking, what are your thoughts about other companies like a publisher to do the marketing for you? I'm going to talk about that really quickly, Tamara, from, I'm, I'm a published author. Um, that, that's my first book um, published by Wiley. My second book was published by Wiley. My third book was, was self-published. Um, so I'm just going to talk about that in terms of an author. Rem- remember that you pay for that, Tamara. Of course, if you're published um, in terms of the um, percentage of, of the, the book sale price that you get, for example, you're paying your publisher to, to do the marketing. Um, what it meant for me was that they got me into WH Smith and things like that. When the book was first published, when the book was first published, since then, um, and the book is seven years, Business Networking for Dummies is seven years old now. Since then, all of the marketing has been down to me. So just talking really specifically about a book publisher, um, it, for me, it was right at the beginning where they did some of the work. Ever since then, it's been all down to me. And and of course, they do charge for it along the way as well. I don't know the sort of volumes that you're looking at, at posting. Um, it and Debbie says Debbie's publisher did hers um, and did a good job and then we talk over and I think Debbie's agreeing with with what I just said in terms of other businesses Steve you handle the marketing for other businesses don't you you handle a very specific set of marketing for other businesses so taking it away from just published authors it actually just in the same way that I use an accountant you would say, of course, that it's sensible for people to outsource their marketing for pe- to to someone who really knows what they're doing with it. Yeah, and and probably surprisingly, I I would also counter that with, um, you know, as a business owner, you should absolutely um, be upskilling yourself in marketing so you can do some of it yourself, um, because there's a lot you can do yourself, and I think people sort of uh, miss. Um, you know, the, the, the types of stuff they, they can do. They can create video content. You don't need a marketing agency for that. You know, you can do it off your phone. You can, there's so much you can do with, you know, with your iPhone um, that negates the need, um, you know, for, um, you can build a website, you know, yourself. And I'm, and I'm not advocating doing everything yourself, but if you're just starting out and you don't have the money, then, you know, it's very difficult to sort of to do that. But if you can then get yourself, and I, I talked about this earlier, it's like a video game. If you can get out of level one and get onto level two of the video game, you know, then you can start to sort of bring in a, a qualified, experienced marketer that can, you know, help you create and formulate a strategy, you know, so, so that it does start to uh, tighten up where you spend your money, who your audience is, where to find them, uh, what types of messages are, are likely to connect with them, um, you know, and then you kind of move up the levels. Um, so absolutely, I advocate uh, employing, um, you know, marketing consultants and agencies. But again, it's kind of, uh, you know, which ones do you hire? How do you know? How do you know if they're any good? And I think that comes back to, you know, my own advice, which is you know, you've got to get your testimonials out there, your recommendations out there. You've got to, you know, build those assets yourself. Um, you know, for, in order for people to trust you, you know, to get to know you and, and to trust you. Um, so, so yeah, a big advocate for outsourcing, but, you know, until you're there, there's lots you can do yourself. You've, I mean, you've raised something really interesting, and that is that in terms of giving people the chance to trust you, how often should any of us, whether it's Debbie or Jen or Tamara or me, Damien, how how often should any of us be turning up on LinkedIn and other social media platforms to 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 to, to build our audience, whether that's selling books or B2B services or whatever it happens to be, how often should should we be out there talking to people ourselves? Well, I'm going to throw a huge caveat in because I know there's um, there's a, a very well-known and very well-skilled LinkedIn trainer on the call. So I'm going to be careful what I say. I just go with my own gut instinct and what, you know, what I've kind of picked up along the way, which is, you know, I would show up daily 
on a consistent basis with at least one thing to say, you know, that hits some of the pain points that your target audience is, is suffering from, that talks a little bit about, you know, your experience and, you know, that shows empathy, that you've got empathy with your audience, um, share a, you know, a variety of, of media. So, you know, some videos, some polls, a, you know, a photograph, you know, of you, of you, you know, doing whatever you're doing in, in the day. I mean, you know, you showed the photo earlier of us um, talking about the book. That will go out on uh, my, my LinkedIn profile. Because I think here's the thing, you know, if we've got 3,000 connections or 30,000 connections, number one, they're not all on LinkedIn every day. Number one, if by some random chance they were all on LinkedIn at the same time, then the chance is the algorithm showing, you know, that piece of content to every single one of your connections is is beyond, you know, comprehension so i would say i mean look consistency in any sort of marketing is really really key so whatever platform you're on consistently showing up consistently sharing great value content you know is, is going to build you know that connection with your audience i'm, I'm going to give her a shout out because you've you've alluded to her but the, <laughs> the 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 linkedin trainer and expert that we're talking about is debbie gilbert who's who's busy commenting on here and i know um both Steve and me are huge fans of Debbie. Um, so yeah, let's let's shout it out. Debbie, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, Debbie, if you've got anything to add to what Steve just said, um, pop it in the comments. I'll, I'll bring it up on screen for you as well. Um, what about making sure that we, we stand out, Steve? What about making sure that, that we get noticed, whether it is a children's book or a public speaker or a customer experience expert, how how can we make sure that, that that we actually get seen in amongst this this sea of content that's out there? Yeah, I think you know the the simple thing comes back to, um, I think we all apart from apart from a few we all play it far too safe on social media, and that's not saying you have to come out and be sweary or or do this or do that you know to get noticed, but I do think you have to take some risks. And move out of your whatever you know comfort zone you're in because there is so much content out in the world um you know it's it's really really <laughs> it's, it's really really um easy to stay safe um so i think for any uh business owner that is relying on on you know organic um you know marketing um that's not spending money on primetime tv or radio or any any of that stuff um you, you just got to take risks with your content you know um rather than than uh, sort of be be uh, staid and boring just you know try and be brave and and stand out you know and whatever however that manifests itself is going to be very uh, individual in, in people's different markets but i think there's always room on social media to be uh, respectfully contrarian in your views so not always follow the status quo offer a different view um you know and 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 yeah just just be be bold with your marketing certainly i was just looking to see if i could bring it up on screen but i don't think i'm going to be that um organized certainly something that has worked for me um as well as all of the business stuff that i put out there i put a ton of networking content out there but something that has worked in a big way a massive way for me actually is is talking about who i am on linkedin as well um i'm looking for the individual posters as i'm talking to you but talking about stuff like um the the music that i'm into um talking about um things like i'm going to bring this up on screen because it's it's relevant i'm i'm not terribly controversial as as a person so everything that steve's saying is right and actually i'm usually not brave enough for want of a better expression to be out there and be controversial um so why do, why do you do that I'll, I'll add a couple of examples to that because being on. brave and being bold you know sometimes means you know in in some people yeah doing outlandish things they think of you know richard branson sort of dressing up as an air stewardess and stuff like that and yeah that's really edgy and it worked for him but it's not going to work for everyone so being bold and and taking risks um, could mean, you know, um, you know, if your industry says uh, we tie people into 12 month contracts, well, why not, you know, try and disrupt and be bold and brave and do a, a rolling 30 day contract with your clients, you know, and go against swim against the status quo. Um, you know, is there a way that you can build a guarantee into your business? Can you guarantee 
delivery of your service and come up with a really bold promise that says, if we don't deliver that, then we will do this. Uh, if you think about FedEx uh, in the probably 80s or 90s came up with the, you know, delivered next day, that was their promise. Anywhere in the world next day, that was their brand promise, really bold, really out there. Um, and, and, you know, they were being held to it. Um, so actually being bold and brave is not necessarily, you know, doing stunts or, or anything like that. It's just looking at your market and how can you disrupt it? How can you um, turn things on its head? How can you go against convention in your industry that separates you out from your competitors? One of the things to, to pick up on something that you said earlier, you said about the importance of building brand assets, whether that's photos or, or whatever it, it happens to be. What I've found is that, you know, putting a photo of me 15 years ago, speaking, um, reading from a, a, a sheet of A4 paper alongside a photo of me last year when I no longer read from a sheet of A4 paper. And I, I arguably got my wardrobe sorted out a bit better these days as well. Um, that the relevance of that to me is that had I not had that photo from 15 years ago, I'd have never been able to create this post, which is what a couple of weeks ago, something like that, two weeks ago. Um, that post generated over 8,000 impressions. Um, the relevance of that being that a load of those people who had liked that post, the 163 people who liked it, because it's a photo of me when I used to be a lot fatter and a photo of me dressed a bit better, um, and plus some stuff about my journey. I didn't used to be a good speaker, but I had to do hundreds of gigs as a not very good speaker to get to be a good one. That When I next post something about my business, some of those 163 people who've liked it, some of those people who've commented on it, are much more likely to get served that by the algorithm, um, my next post. Plus, it, it, this is my way of sticking out. It shows a more human side of me rather than just the, 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 the business side of me as well. Um, and that, yeah, that has, has worked for me along the, the, the That bit about having assets that Steve is talking about this afternoon is so important because I've got 15 years worth of them, including yeah. now this interview that I'm doing this afternoon with there is, Steve. Um, there is, so if I can just add to that, there is a, a formula um, or a model that Google came up with years ago. And if, and if you go and, go and um, Google it, there you go, that's ironic, Google something that Google came up with. Um, it's called the 7114. Some of you might have heard of it, some of you may not. But the way that it's broken down is, um, you know, and this is a sweet spot. This is not, you know, this is not, um, you know, based on absolute science. But this is a good, I'd say, benchmark to try and achieve in your business is having seven hours of content available um, online. So when you're sleeping, people can consume some of your content. And that could be podcasts. It could be a video series on YouTube. It could be a book that you've written, white papers, blogs long form LinkedIn articles and posts, any number of, of con any, any amount of content that adds up to seven hours or more, that's a good sweet spot to aim for. That that will then give people, um, you know, uh, 11 or more touch points with your brand over time. You know, it could be an email newsletter that drops in their box every week um, on four different uh, platforms. So that's, you know, voice, um, uh, uh, video, uh, written um, and even face to face. So, you know, running webinars, events, workshops, networking is another touch point. But that's the, the sweet spot, 7.11.4. It's, it's a good little kind of benchmark to aim for when you're starting off. That makes a ton of sense. We've got um, Sammy and Courtney from Grace Gits with us this afternoon, and they're huge. They're not huge themselves, but they're huge creators of content. They create a ton of content um, and they're endorsing the fact that I had a photo from 15 years ago and your um, your suggestion to make sure that we take photos, whether we use our phones or or get a professional photographer to, to do it. I've just had a load of pro photos um, taken um, by a professional photographer because we're doing something slightly different with, with my speaking brand going forward. And so it was you know, great to have Barbara actually follow Sarah, Sharon and I around for a little while and, and get these photos. Um, but yeah, Sammy and Courtney, don't know which one of you is typing, but um, have said you should always take a picture. You never know when when you will use it, which I think is is terrific advice. I've I've talked in the past about being seen everywhere, and that seems to be what, 
what you're saying as well, Steve. If you've got all of this different content out there in different places, then there's a much bigger chance that, that people are actually going to spot it, isn't there? I mean, yeah. that, that's um, relatively simple, but most of us overlook that most of the time. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the more chance you've got of being seen, and, and it's important that the content, you know, you, there is a there is a strategy behind it, you know, and it's to build you, uh, if you're a you know single owner, operator of a business, it's about building your profile, building that connection with your audience, you know, breaking down those barriers over the screen, but also on the, you know, like, like we said, answering some of the pain points of your target audience and talking about those and, you know, coming from a position of authority, really important. Um, I'm going to, let Sammy and Courtney have this shout out. Their overnight success was posting 2,000 TikToks. Um, I think Steve and I are going to love that because we just, we, we both know, talking here, that the the overnight stuff takes a lot more effort than um, most people are, are, are willing to put in. And thank you, um, Sammy and Courtney, for joining us again this afternoon. You've been a, a big supporter of, of my lives. Um, Steve and I are going to be here for another few minutes. If anyone else has got any other questions, pop them in the comments below um, and Steve will, will, will answer them. What else have, have you got to say, Steve? Marketing our way through a recession. What, what else should people yeah. be doing? I think, you know, I, I read this years ago and it's always stuck with me. Um, and I think it was through the it was an article I read in the last kind of big recession, 2008, eight nine, And it was um, human behavior places products and services into four distinct categories essentials so you know bread water shelter all of that sort of stuff that is uh, essential we then have uh, treats um, and treats are really important because um, we need those to have those dopamine hits and, and build ourselves up and reward ourselves postponables is is the third kind of category that i would i would say um, and that that stuff that you can kind of put off it could be a holiday you know, it's we're not saying that we're never going to have a holiday again. It's, um, you know, we, we might put them off. And then the final one is, is the expendables. And they're the essentially the luxuries that we really can live without, you know, and, and I would probably put things like Netflix, kind of Sky and, and stuff like that in that bracket. So how that is relevant, I think, to, to running a business. And this is what always stuck with me is is to move your business from being, you know, expendable to being essential. You know, how do you how do you how do you position, you know, how do you, you know, kind of create your service or your product so that it fits in that essential category? You know, and that is about delivering, you know, consistent results, consistent outcomes that your, you know, your clients desire. If you can do that on a consistent basis, you, you will become in, in that essential bracket. And if you can make yourself essential uh, to your clients, then, you know, you have uh, less chance of them churning and also as a result of delivering that success of acquiring new new customers that want a piece of that pie piece of the action <laughs> now i just want a pie um <laughs> <laughs> after i'm gonna do this again let's just scroll this up so look for the folks who are joining us i've already put a link to steve's linkedin profile in the comments just scroll up a bit and find it but that's where you'll find steve if you're not already connected with him um anywhere else that, that people should connect with you steve is linkedin the best place for them to find you or or where LinkedIn, else people if you want to have a look at um you know some of the work that i've done and some of the services that i offer you can have a look at uh, steve mark .co.uk. Um, I'll tell you what, let's just pop us back on screen because um, I always forget to do that bit. And... While, you're doing, while you're doing that, I just wanted to share one one kind of final thing. And I think the, one of the biggest things that we've not spoken about, because uh, there hasn't been a question on it, we've not kind of segued into it, is um, especially, you know, when you're dealing with your business, you know, with, with the headwinds that we've got, recession, we may well dip in and out of recession and, and what have you. Um, I think the biggest thing that you can do is, is really look after your people. We've not really discussed people. And, you know, people, if you're a small business, could be your one or two employees, um, or it could be the freelancers, you know, and the agencies that help support your business. And I think valuing them, spending time with them, building those relationships, um, I think is, is, is so important, you know, especially 
if we've got headwinds coming and we need to lean on people a little bit and rely on them a little bit and maybe ask a favor or two having a little bit in the bank to do that and you know and you get that by paying people on time paying invoices on time you know we had uh, in in our group earlier someone who had a little celebration by getting an invoice paid on time i mean that shouldn't be a thing we shouldn't be celebrating getting paid on time <laughs> you know but i think if you want the best out of your people um and the people that support your business just um try and try and get well get them paid on time and look after them and build those relationships it is worth saying on that as well um if you're a local business your staff have got relatives that probably use your services um i'm just throwing that out there not to any business in particular um but local businesses look after your people your your staff have got relatives and friends who are yeah. also your customers or aren't if if you're treating your staff badly um i've put a link to it in the comments but that's steve's website as well where you'll find out a lot more about him um and some of the things that he's doing and can book a call with him and all sorts of other things on there so that's where you'll find steve i've put a link to that i've put a link to his linkedin profile um wow I mean, we've been talking for a long time. It's gone really well, yeah. quickly, and I'm absolutely yeah, thrilled that all of these people have joined us and asked questions along the way. Amazing. Thank you. No, thanks for spending thanks some for, time um, with us this afternoon. Um, if you're watching this on replay, folks, carry on and ask questions, please. Um, I'll tag Steve whenever we get any questions in the comments. So if you're watching this on replay, let us know. Ask any questions or challenge anything that, that we've got to say. Um any final final thoughts before we go steve no i do, do you know what i think we've we've kind of covered everything that i wanted to talk about um you know i think it's um you know the the best the best piece of advice i can offer is is that you know it's how you move your business into being an essential because if you're an essential in somebody's life they're not going to do away with you you know they they need you you know to to grow their business um, and if you do that, you don't need to discount. And if you're not discounting, you've got the revenue coming in. And if you've got the revenue coming in, you can carry on investing in your marketing, growing your brand, growing your audience. So when we do come out the other side of this, and we will come out because it's all cyclical, um, you're going to be in a much, much stronger position. I'm going to finish with that because it's such a brilliant piece of advice. Um, Steve, thanks ever so much for spending some time with us. Um, looks like Jen was happy, but yeah, thank you, Steve. Thanks for, for spending the time this afternoon. Um, I have been talking to Steve Mark. Um, I'm going to press the button to disconnect us from LinkedIn. Thank you for all of those who've joined us this afternoon and asked questions and engaged or just watched or listened or whatever you were doing. Um, I'll be back next week talking to some other people, but I've really, really 